Let's talk domestication. Don't worry, I'm getting under the couch. No, not that type of domestication. This kind. Over the millennia, selective breeding turned that howl into this. That's right. Humans took a fearsome wild species, Canis lupus, the wolf, and deliberately selected for traits that would eventually produce Canis lupus familiaris, the domesticated dog. Dogs were an early experiment in domestication and a successful one. Everyone but perhaps the most devoted cat lover would agree. But our ability to shape evolution has itself evolved from a time when selective breeding was the only method by which we could influence a genome and produce a desired trait or behavior. Now, genetic engineering and synthetic biology have given us laboratory tools so that the question is not what kind of changes can we make to DNA, but how radical and how fast. I'm Molly Bentley. I'm Seth Shostak, and welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we step back to get the wide-angle view on science and technology. Today, scientists are developing the technology that can shape evolution directly by recombining DNA or inserting novel genes directly into genomes and maybe even producing new, some would say improved, species. But is the world we create with this technology a better one? It's the evolution of evolution. Are you an urbanophile? Is New York where you'd rather stay allergic to smelling hay? Well, you have hay to thank for Broadway and 42nd Street. Science writer Richard Francis says that no less than civilization itself was created when humans grabbed the steering wheel of evolution and began to domesticate plants and animals. Before the agricultural revolution, all humans lived as hunter-gatherers, uh, semi-nomadic in groups of from 30 to 100. But with the advent of agriculture, first with plant domestication, came the first villages. With the villages came a greater concentration of mines and hence creative cultural activities that would not have happened in, say, a hunter-gatherer society. Then, when animals were domesticated and put in a barn or a pen or a yard, guaranteeing a reliable source of protein, these villages grew, resulting in the first cities of the Middle East, in the so-called Fertile Crescent, but also in China and the Indus Valley. And as much as domesticated creatures have served us well, well, they've reaped some benefits too, says Richard Francis in his book, Domesticated Evolution in a Man-Made World. Now, dogs were domesticated before the agricultural revolution, and we'll get to how the formidable wolf evolved into the lap-loving chihuahua in a moment. But moving along, we begin with another animal, the dairy cow. Ever take a good look at one? This lumbering, tranquil beast is a poster animal for domestication. The cow is not exactly a type A personality, but its ancestor was a fierce-looking wild species of cattle, now extinct, called the auroch. Well, an auroch is a hugely impressive beast. I mean, there's a quote in my book from Caesar who had never seen an auroch in Italy because they were extinct by that time. But when he went into Gaul, France, he saw them for the first time and he was just blown away. They're huge. They're 3,000 pounds, the males sometimes. And they were mean. I mean, they, they would attack people. They, they had this huge attraction because of the meat, but they were dangerous. So it wasn't their attraction for dairy farming that, that got the attention yeah. of our ancestors, right? It was just, hey, this is meat on the hoof. Exactly. It's a, the dairy farming came much later, and, and that's an interesting story in itself. That's called the secondary products revolution, and that happened with a lot of domestic creatures like sheep. Their uh, secondary product is their wool. Horses were meat originally, but then when they became uh, animals that could be ridden, that was the secondary products revolution for horses. So the aurochs, they're brought in for meat. They stay for the, uh, the milk, the butter, the cheese, all that stuff. 
Um, we, we say they've been domesticated, but I, that word is used in such a broad range of, of contexts. I mean, people talk about their spouse yes. being domesticated, or maybe not. But, <laughs> but, but whatever. Yeah, but but I, I can't imagine that an auroch is you know living at home with the kids. Uh, but what does it really mean when you say domestication? And that's after all, you know, the title of your book is domesticated. Right. What does that mean? How how do I define something as being domesticated? Yeah. Well, we should view domestication as a process. And there are various stages in this process. Often in the initial stages, the uh, wild animals themselves initiate it through some attraction to human habitations, to something that humans have to provide. That's certainly true of dogs and cats. But with respect to cattle, say, and pigs and sheep and goats, the next stage was kind of a loose management of the wild herds. Then came a selective culling, especially of the young males in particular. Once these young males were preferentially culled, this caused a really significant change in the selection regime because once the competition amongst males for mates was reduced by the elimination of most of the males, there was a, a reduction in sexual selection, what we call sexual selection, and with it, there was a reduction in the sex differences of many of our domesticated animals. Okay, so you're saying the males and the females didn't, uh, they weren't all that different uh, by the time he got done with this process. Well, they're still different, but much less so than in the wild state. But how does that work? Because I might imagine that once the aurochs had gotten my attention, I might take the ones that look beefiest and uh -huh. say, those are the ones that I want to produce offspring. And, and consequently, you know, 50 generations down the line, all the aurochs are big, beefy, and so forth, and, and they don't look like the females anymore. I mean, how did that work? <laughs> well, actually, the opposite occurred. The, the, what they wanted was the smallest aurochs because they're the least dangerous and uh -huh. easiest to handle. And they especially wanted the smallest males because they're the real danger. Okay. Well, I can see what the humans got out of this. I mean, right. they, they got a better dinner. Yeah. What do the, uh, the bovines get out of this? Did they get anything out of it? Well, the bovines, what they got out of it was by being managed, they weren't hunted out of existence. All the wild fauna was hunted into extinction. So the only large mammals that could survive in that kind of uh, human man-made environment were those that were useful to humans. And uh, fortunately for some of these cattle, they became useful to humans. And same with sheep and goats. Okay, so in fact, I mean, this is kind of an interesting trade-off. You uh, eventually end up at the abattoir, but in the meantime, uh, your numbers are enormously increased, and you're going to be around 20 years from now. Exactly, and you're, <laughs> you're going to leave lots of descendants. That's really very interesting. Now, the poster child, or maybe I should say the poster critter for domestication, of course, is the dog, mm -hmm. which is at heart a wolf, I guess. So when we talk about domestication, are we talking about really creating a new species altogether? Or, I mean, in other words, is Fido just a kinder, gentler wolf, or is he really a new species, or does it matter? You know, there's some dispute about whether to call domesticated dogs a different species. And in fact, they are assigned a different scientific uh, species name. I don't ascribe to that. They breed, interbreed freely with wolves. If they're, if they're of the right size. And given the right opportunity, yeah, I suppose. given the right size. And there's no, judging by the biological, what's known as the biological species concept, they should be considered the same species. But there is a convention that assigns them a different species category because they are, they are so different, phenotypically. But basically, even a Pekingese is more closely related to a wolf, say, than a coyote is to a wolf. And they're very closely related. So how do you get something like a curly-haired poodle? That must be a tough job. And, and we've done it in only, what, a few thousand years or something. So dogs were domesticated, some say, as early as 35,000 years ago. But those domesticated dogs didn't look a whole lot different from wolves, except that they were smaller and tamer. But it's in the last, um, not even the last few thousand years, in the last few hundred years, really, that we've gotten these exotic creatures like poodles, and that did come from selective breeding. Those are random mutations that somebody decided it would be cool to perpetuate. With certain hair qualities, such as the curly hair poodles, they're actually advantageous for what they were originally bred for, which was the water dogs. You know, it's just easier for them to dry off, and there are some of these what are called 
furnishings that were adaptive but no longer. There's something called neoteny, uh, and I, I've heard it actually applied to, for example, the females of our species, you know, uh -huh. that, that the adults look like the children in some sense, mm -hmm. like the juveniles, and that seems to be something that accompanies domestication. Do, do we understand why that is? Is it just that you'd rather have a critter around the house that looks cuter? Or is, <laughs> what, what's the deal? No, it wasn't just for cuteness. Originally, if, if you wanted to get a less fearful animal, say, one way to do that is to extend the, the window of socialization. And once the fear response kicks in in dogs, say, they're much less amenable to socialization. So basically they wanted to extend the period during which this friendly period during which they could be socialized. And the best way to do that, or one way to do that, certainly, is, is neoteny, which is to basically slow down the rate of development. That's what neoteny basically is. Richard, are there animals we domesticate without really wanting to, like, like rats? I mean, <laughs> they go where we go. They live off our garbage. They seem fearless enough, at least in some cities anyway. Is the taming of the wild rat an example of kind of unintentional domestication? I don't think of them as pets. Right. Well, you know, the, what we can, you know, the sewer rats of, of New York are actually still wild rats. They're not domesticated rats. There are domesticated rats, but that's very recently. It started in the 19th century in England where they, they started developing what they call fancy rats and fancy mice. But the rats are still wild. And so are, for example, uh, squirrels, pigeons, house sparrows. But all those animals that have this close association with humans, which we call commensals, are vulnerable to domestication should the desire arise. Now, one animal that I find particularly interesting, which is sort of self-domesticating right now, is the raccoon. It, even in the most densely populated metropolitan areas, Toronto's got this huge raccoon problem. They got population densities that you'll never find in nature. So, I mean, there, there's something really great for raccoons about living in cities. And maybe they like Canadian healthcare. They like, maybe that, that would be a good reason, but they're also common in Detroit. But the fascinating thing about the raccoons, in order for them to, to thrive in the cities at those densities, they have to not only tolerate us, they have to tolerate each other much more than they would do so in the wild. So they have to become more sociable. This is part of this self-domesticating process, the self-taming process, which is the initial stage of domestication. A lot of animals never get past that. And for raccoons, who knows? Richard, have there been any uh, attempts at domestication that have gone horribly wrong somehow? Well, I would say the terminal stage of the domestication process in dogs has gone horribly wrong. Once kennel clubs were established, dog evolution took a perverse turn, no more so than in the English bulldog. The bulldog was originally used in an activity called bull baiting. So these were agile, strong creatures. They tried to sneak up on the bull and grab it by the snout without getting gored. Even if you look at that animal from like Charles Darwin's time, 1859, it looks completely different than the English bulldog today, which is a grotesque animal. Its snout is so shortened that it can't breathe because its palate bunches up in the back. It can't close its eyelids, so it's got all kinds of eye infections. It's got skin folds that get infected. They can't walk for any length of time without having to stop and pant and pant and pant because of the fact they can't breathe well. This is truly perverse, both evolutionarily and morally. Well, finally, Richard, we've talked about uh, domesticating animals. What about humans? It may just be me, but frankly, I think we are a lot more attractive than, I don't know, Neanderthals or any of those things you find in the museum, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, we, I, I think we just look better. We don't have all those eyebrow ridges or whatever that kind of thing. I mean, have we been domesticated by something or are we domesticating ourselves? That's an increasingly popular and intriguing idea that humans are self-domesticated. Now, the idea is not so much that we lost our brow ridges and got less hairy, but we became much more sociable, tolerant of each other. In fact, we are the most, by far, the most sociable mammals on Earth. 
And this goes a long way toward explaining our success. Our ability to cooperate with each other is based on the fact that we can tolerate close proximity of each other. So what I find most intriguing about this idea is that it, it takes the emphasis a bit away from our intelligence, of which we are justifiably proud, and looks more at our emotional constitution for our evolutionary success. And basically, if we were, say, 10 times smarter than we are, but we live with a solitary existence, we would never have accomplished what we have. It was our ability to cooperate, to work collectively, that makes humans the masters of the planet. Richard Francis, thanks so very much for speaking with us today. It's my pleasure. Richard Francis is a science writer and the author of Domesticated Evolution in a Man-Made World. Still amazing that dogs come from wolves. <laughs> yeah, although I find that less amazing than the fact that we've done so much in the past just couple of hundred years to dogs and that he actually blames our fascination with peculiar breeds for producing breeds that would never have survived if nature had developed them. The bigger picture here, of course, is that we've got this symbiotic relationship with these domesticated animals. And, you know, you can say, okay, it's good. It gives us a supply of hamburger. But on the other hand, the bigger point is that without it, you wouldn't have had civilization, apparently. The vegetarians wouldn't say that. Well, maybe a bigger supply of carrots. Well, yeah, but that's short-sighted of them because, indeed, without those domesticated animals, who's going to pull the plow to get ready to grow those carrots? So I think you need them even if you don't eat them. Although carrots are supposed to be very good for your eyes, right? So maybe <laughs> so they wouldn't say. be. Maybe they wouldn't be short-sighted for long. <laughs> Oh, yeah, they'd be long-sighted. Yes, yes, indeed. Well, that's a, sort of a myopic point of view. But I do think it's interesting that these symbiotic relationships develop, and it's been more than one. So it sounds like a very general feature of, uh, you know, a diverse biota. Do you have any domesticated animals or plants in your life? <laughs> I have a plant in my office. I wouldn't call it domesticated. I would call it suffering. <laughs> So we've heard how the mighty wolf's haunting howl became the yip-yap of the docile Pekingese and why your child's next pet might be a raccoon. But what happens when evolution enters the laboratory? The sophisticated tools of genetic engineering can speed up evolution, even cross species barriers along the way, and now we're turning those tools on ourselves. Can we re-engineer our genome and build a better human? It's the evolution of evolution on Big Picture Science. Support for Big Picture Science comes from the Making and Science team at Google. Introducing Science Journal, an app to explore and measure light, sound, acceleration, and other natural phenomena. Do you have a question about your environment or a project you've built? Find the Science Journal app, hands-on activities, and more at g.co slash science journal app and start investigating. Classical breeding and domestication are low-tech forms of genetic engineering. Yes, we get an animal that has particular physical or behavioral traits by selecting genes that code for them. But the selection is done only by observing the phenotype, the outward expression of the trait. You know, you want a schnauzer with more beard on its snout? Well, you find schnauzers whose beards are already a little fuller and you breed those. Keep doing this for a number of generations and eventually you may get a more hirsute hound. But imagine if you could identify the actual gene or set of genes for a woolly snout. Then you could insert them directly into the DNA of a schnauzer embryo and get a hairier beast in just one generation. With genetic engineering, scientists deliberately add individual genes to an organism's genome to produce a trait that it doesn't already have. And this technology isn't just going to the dogs. It's been applied to many species and sometimes by combining the DNA of different species. Some real products of genetic engineering include glow-in-the-dark cats, cabbage that produces scorpion venom, and goat's milk that uh, generates a spider's web protein for the production of super strong products. Some of these experiments have practical uses in mind. Others are simply a proof of concept. 
but now we're turning the technology on ourselves. Humans can tinker with their own genome. For example, gene therapy has eliminated genes for a certain disease, but there is the potential to engineer in novel traits as well. Do you want your baby to have red hair, a talent for languages, to glow in the dark? By taking control of the expression of genes at the level of DNA, we are approaching evolution in a radical new way, possibly creating Homo sapiens 2.0. How far will this technology go? Will your grandkids be a different species? Well, these are the kind of questions that Juan Enriquez contemplates. Working at the intersection of science, business, and society, he examines the sociological and economic impact of life sciences. He was the founding director of the Life Sciences Project at Harvard Business School and is the managing director of Excel Venture Management. And he was a member of Craig Venter's team to collect genetic data from the world's oceans. He's also the co-author, most recently, of Evolving Ourselves, How Unnatural Selection and Non-Random Mutation Are Changing Life on Earth. So, Juan... Are we truly prepared for the changes that are coming through genetic engineering? I think we have no idea just how far our grandkids are going to carry this. And you can take something completely uncontroversial like sex and think about how it's changed. Our grandparents never controlled when a baby was born. Our grandparents never thought of freezing sperm, freezing eggs. This year we're going to have the first human being born to three parents. Last year, we had the first human being born in a transplanted uterus. And these things are changing, and they're changing very quickly. And as we learn how to edit genes, some of the moral and ethical questions we're going to be faced with are going to be pretty extraordinary. Well, one thing that frequently comes up are designer babies, right? And, you know, a lot of people will say the first reaction to that, at least in my limited experience, is that, oh, no, man, uh, you know, don't want to go there. That's uh, ethically uh, very doubtful. We don't want to do that. And yet, I, I can hardly imagine that if you confronted a young woman who was pregnant and you said, look, $50 more and we'll make sure that the kid has the uh, IQ of Stephen Hawking and another 50 bucks, you know, the looks of, uh, I don't know, Kim Kardashian. I, I don't know, but something. I can hardly imagine people would turn that down. Maybe some would, but most might not. So isn't that an obvious step that we're likely to take that uh, has unforeseen consequences? Well, I think the first steps in this will be taken because you want to alter the genes so that the baby doesn't get a deadly disease. Once you do that, then other kinds of genes come into play. So there's certain genes that allow you to climb an 8,000-meter peak without oxygen. There are certain genes that give you certain athletic abilities. And, and what that leads to is a question, how do we want to run the Olympics? Do we want the Olympics to be a showcase for really hardworking mutants? Do we want the Olympics to be like sailing and golf where you have a handicap so everybody competes on the same level? Or if it's safe, do you want everybody to be able to upgrade and compete at the same level? Yeah. Well. I mean, in the Olympics, I can see that as a very practical consequence of this kind of work because now suddenly we're not all created equal, right? And doesn't that lead to a social problem in itself? If we're able to improve our kids via this technique, I mean, some of us will be more able to do that simply from a financial point of view than others. Uh, this sounds like it could be a bit Orwellian at some stage. I don't think so. You know, we, two decades ago, three decades ago, when the computers were expensive and rare and we had internet cafes, everybody thought there was going to be a huge digital divide and only the rich would have computers. And it's turned out that the price of computers, because of Moore's Law, which doubles the power every 18 months and halves the price, is something that's brought computers to the street salesman in Mumbai. And they've got as much access to information as the president of the U.S. used to have a few decades ago. I think the same thing will happen with gene research. I think what gene research is going to lead to is we'll have more diversity, we'll have more choices, and I think that's a good thing. Tell me some other examples of the things that we could do to not just, you know, forestall disease. I, I can see that once you understand the genetics of a particular disease, you might be able to just take that out of the genome of an unborn kid and then they'll, they'll never get it, whatever. Uh, but what about engineering new eyes because I believe some German scientists have done something along those lines to help a blind person see or re-engineering eyes so that we don't just see the, the range of the spectrum that we do now. We can also see ultraviolet or infrared or something like that. I'm not making that up, am I? I mean, are we going to be able to do this? We're a little bit further behind on eyes than we are on ears. So if you think back to hearing aids, our grandparents probably use these great big cones 
And our parents probably used these great big boxes that would squawk at odd hours, that would sit above their ears. And today, hearing aids, you almost don't see them. They're inside your ear and they're very small and effective. But these hearing aids have evolved to the point where now a deaf person can hear, and not only can hear, can hear a complex conversation in a crowded room. These hearing aids are going to continue to evolve very quickly. Our ears are not. So what we, may happen in the next 10 years, 15 years, is that those with hearing aids will hear better than you and I do, and they may be able to hear in tones that you and I do. They may be able to hear things that a dolphin would hear, or a bat would hear, or a dog would hear. And it's not inconceivable in a couple of decades that you will not be hired by a symphony orchestra if you don't have a cochlear implant. <laughs> well, and also the genetic modification that makes you, you know, Yasha Heifetz or something on the violin or something like that. Okay, so you're talking about something that's more than remedial. It's not that we're just going to give you a better hearing aid because your hearing's failing. It's not even that we're going to re-engineer the little hairs in your inner ear so that you don't need the hearing aid to begin with. We're going to give you, we're going to, <laughs> it's like the bionic man. We're going to give you better ears. That's where we're going? I think you're going to see a whole series of changes that are very hard for you and I to comprehend. I think one of the single most interesting experiments that probably will be done in the next decade is transplanting an entire rat's head. And, and the reason why that's such an interesting experiment is because we're, we're getting very good at vascular surgery and reattaching hands and reattaching faces and restitching muscles. We're almost at the point where we're going to be able to regrow the spinal cord of a mouse or a rat. When we do that, then the interesting question is, if you transplant the head, are you transplanting consciousness? Are you transplanting memories? Just what are you transplanting? And, you know, when we did the first heart transplants, there was a question. Would the recipient fall in love with the donor's wife? Would he feel affection for the children? Because for 2,000 years, we told people, she took my heart, she broke my heart, she did this to my heart. We thought the heart was something other than a muscle. Yeah. Well, that turned out not to be a very well-founded uh, concern. But on the other hand, if you're talking about the head, if you're talking about the brain, you know, people have a different view of the brain than they do of their hearts or their livers or their pancreases or whatever, right? That, uh, you know, the brain contains what we are. So how far is this going to go? Are we, are we really going to be able in the foreseeable future to, uh, you know, just get a brain replacement or a head replacement? Well, there's a huge implication if you transplant those rat brains or not brains, heads, because it's, it would be almost impossible to transplant a brain. But the head is a doable operation. And if you can do that and you transplant memory and you transplant consciousness, that means the brain is downloadable. And then the only question is, what are you going to download it into? And then it gets really interesting because then you could download it into another body or perhaps something else. Well... Juan, I'm sure that if you tell people who are sitting next to you on the T in the <laughs> on the way to work in the morning, you know, what you do for a living, they might ask you, so what does this mean? I mean, what are people going to be like 50 or 100 years from now? What do you tell them? You know, I tell them the single thing, which is I think the most interesting challenge we are facing as, as a species, as humans, is we've taken direct and deliberate control over the evolution of a big chunk of this planet. So half of the landmass on Earth, what lives and dies, used to be determined by nature and it's now determined by humans because we put our cities over here, we put our cows over here, we put our wheat over here, we put our rice paddies over here, we put our vacation homes over here, and we choose what lives and dies there. If you walk through a cornfield, it's what we want. It's not what nature wants, what lives and dies there. We're doing the same thing with bacteria. We're doing the same thing with animals, house pets, cattle. What are we going to do with this extraordinary power to guide evolution, to determine what lives and dies? Another kind of evolution, it would seem to me, is the kind of selection that is imposed by modern society. It's becoming, so they say, a meritocracy, which would suggest that, you know, well, you could say that's why the IQ is going up, because the, the smart people are earning more money so they can have more kids and this sort of thing. I don't know. This sounds like sort of a unintentional eugenics in a way. Uh, is this a real effect or, or not? So there's a whole series of absolutely extraordinary things happening to human mating patterns. Um, let me give you a couple of examples. One of the kinkiest things going out there and strangest things going out there is unlike every other species on Earth, 
when you've got leisure time, when you've got food, when things are good, when you can control the weather, we don't have more kids. Every other species, when things are good, they're more boogie nights. And for us, the richer the country gets, the less kids you have. So we're directly and deliberately choosing our path to evolution and reproduction and going in the opposite direction of what would be quote-unquote natural. A second way in which has become really different is if you had Asperger's and you worked on you know, labor or a farm or a factory, chances are you were going to get hurt. Today, if you've got Asperger's, you know, 25% of the working force at some of the top tech companies in Silicon Valley and other places are people who are incredibly good at focusing, at coding, at finding those small details. And not only are they protected, they are very well rewarded, and they meet, and they have children, and let's see what happens. This will be interesting. Well, finally, Juan, I can imagine that if uh, Charles Darwin were, <laughs> were listening to this, I, I doubt that he is. But if you were, you might say, you know, what these guys are talking about is the end of Darwinian evolution, at least for this one species called uh, Homo sapiens. Is that what's really happening here? I think you're absolutely right. So the, the irony of this thing is it isn't the religious fundamentalists that are gradually killing Darwin, it's scientists. And the way they're killing it is for four billion years, what lived and died on this planet depended on natural selection and random mutation. And now what we've done is we've flipped that on its head because it's not just nature that selects, we select. And that's unnatural selection. And then the second thing that's happened is as of the last 40 years, we've learned how to code genes. We've learned how to read genomes and rewrite them. And when we take control of life code, then it's not random mutation. It's, if you want to pick a random phrase, close to intelligent design. Juan Enriquez, thanks so very much for speaking with us. A great pleasure. Juan Enriquez is an academic, a businessman, and author who studies the economic and political impact of the life sciences. He was the founding director of the Life Sciences Project at Harvard Business School and is the managing director of Excel Venture Management. And he is the co-author of Evolving Ourselves, How Unnatural Selection and Non-Random Mutation Are Changing Life on Earth. The idea of transplanting ahead, well, that's one way to get ahead in business or life. <laughs> yes, yes, possibly. But uh, I don't know. Do you think that's going to happen very quickly that you change your head? And if you change your head, I mean, are you still the same person? I mean, that's the fundamental question. I really don't understand how that can be the same person. Well, and then all these other genetic modifications that we can make to the species, it's a little spooky. It's more than spooky. And when you think of the history of humankind, you know, the, the arc of history, the, the evolution of culture and civilization, and all these grand things we talk about all the time, one constant in all that is that Homo sapiens was always Homo sapiens. And now suddenly, if you're changing the species out from underneath us, I mean, what is that going to do to future history? Well, it sounds like we're making ourselves better, faster, and stronger with a few updates. <laughs> Steve Houston, astronaut, a man barely awake. <sighs> Gentle persons, on the other side of this glass is the laziest astronaut at the agency. Houston, wake up. Oh, yeah. It's what, uh, 10 a.m.? And time to get up? Why? I was awake yesterday. He does not seem to be very motivated. Hey, can I get a mocha over here? Maybe a donut? Anyone got today's word jumble? How did he become an astronaut? All the most qualified astronauts have joined private rocket companies. Our space agency can't compete with the thrill of novel hardware or the excitement of actual space missions. Besides, their bennies include free Wi-Fi on board. I see. Steve Houston was the only one who responded to our email blaster looking for volunteers. I think he used to be an usher at Comic-Con. Hey, does this little TV work? He's tapping the cardiac monitor. Can I watch anime on it? The bar certainly has been lowered. That's why you're here. Gentle persons, we can rebuild him. We have the technology. We have the capability to make the world's first genetically engineered man. Steve Houston will be that man. Better than he was before. Better, smarter, or just not dumb. 
and the ability to carry on a conversation without scratching himself. Dr. Wells, you're the genetic engineer. Rebuild him, and I'm prepared to pay you six million dollars. Six million dollars? You can't rebuild a man for that. This is not 1973. Well, what will it cost? Well, with inflation, $31,915,000. So let's call it 32 million. But that will buy you the most advanced genetic improvement in biotech today. Go on. We can insert a suite of genes into Houston's DNA that will give him the traits of an elite astronaut. Genes for fire in the belly, fearlessness, and remaining calm in the most stressful situations. Finally, my mocha. Mm. Hey, is this coffee decaf? What's it gonna take for me to get a decent cup of joe around here? Yeah, those genes sound good. We have also identified genes for thinking clearly, excellent hand-eye coordination, an Ohio accent, and a tolerance for tedium. I am so bored. The bored is. Hey, when do I get to moonwalk? Excellent, Dr. Wells. Oh, hang on. Houston, we have a problem. What? Put out that cigarette. You see that oxygen tank next to your bed? No, no, the other side of the bed. Oh, sorry. You can really give him all those qualities, Dr. Wells? We can, and we will. As we say in the lab, if you can't train the engineer, engineer the training. He will be the finest astronaut at the space agency. He's the only astronaut at the space agency. A $32 million man, huh? Yes. Hey, does the suit come in any color other than white? It's a deal, Dr. Wells. It's a deal. <laughs> So we may be able to remake our genomes to respond to cultural and environmental pressures. We can stay competitive, but what is the fate of species who can't shape their own destiny? Well, the answer is playing out now, as climate change is forcing one of the biggest evolutionary events in history. It's the evolution of evolution on Big Picture Science. Big Picture Science is also supported by Classical Archives. Are you a fan of the musical greats? Classical Archives is the largest classical music site on the web, offering its subscribers unlimited play of any track, complete works, or entire albums with just one click. It's easy to listen to your favorites. Seth is a fan of the Russian romantics, you know, Tchaikovsky, Rimsky-Korsakov, Borodin, those guys. Well, he just ticked the romantic box at Classical Archives and got a list of their must-have and must-know works. And he says his popularity at cocktail parties has never been higher. Classical Archives. It's simple, it's organized, and it's where you should be going for your favorite classical music. ClassicalArchives.com Big Picture Science is also supported in part by Podiversity. Podiversity offers easy access to ad-free podcasts on Android devices. Your subscription to Podiversity helps support the production of Big Picture Science and your other favorite podcasts. Follow your favorite shows and have new episodes downloaded automatically to your Android device. You can download Podiversity from the link at bigpicturescience.org or at podiversity.com. There is one way that we, humans, are altering the genome of thousands of species without bringing a single one anywhere near a lab. The biggest genetic experiment in recorded history is underway now. A rise in atmospheric and ocean temperatures is forcing species to migrate from their familiar habitats, the ones to which they have exquisitely adapted, to new homes. Not all will be successful. Climate change has triggered a genetic lottery by creating new environmental conditions for which some species will have the genes that are adaptive and others won't, and those that don't will go extinct. Biologist Jessica Hellman from Notre Dame says this is happening just at the time when our understanding of life is really taking off. We're beginning to understand life at the level of the cell, how genomes of different species differ, how evolution has produced a stunning array of biological diversity. And so it's a sad irony that just as we come to appreciate the biological richness around us, that diversity is threatened by the sudden evolutionary pressures brought by climate change. Some of them will adapt, but others of them probably won't adapt. I think the thing that's particularly concerning about things like climate change and other forms of environmental change is they're so large in scope and so fast in time 
that those biological processes of evolution and natural change, which have produced all of life on Earth, they may not have an opportunity to act to rescue life in this modern challenge. Now, for some species and some creatures, evolution will proceed along just fine. Think of, you know, you think about microbes certainly don't have any problem evolving very rapidly, but elephants don't evolve so rapidly. So we think about a lot of the, the plants and the animals that we associate with, you know, our companions on this planet, if you will. A lot of them don't have the capacity to rapidly evolve in the face of environmental change. And that's the big concern. One of the things that you study is how species are adapting, and they're already starting to do this. I mean, they're not waiting around until they get, you know, the official government word that this is happening. And I wonder if you could give us an example of how some animal or plant is already adapting to a changing climate. I think this is our one of our main tasks for ecologists and research scientists like myself and my students and my colleagues. When we say that life will be affected all around the world because climate change reaches in every corner and every pocket of life on Earth, some species will experience that and they will have some capacity to deal with it. When you think about maybe a bird, for example, well, it has the ability to move. It can change its location to adjust to the climate. You contrast that to something that doesn't move very readily or has very, very narrow restrictions for the kinds of conditions it can live in. I think a main challenge we have is we have to be able to figure that all out. I I imagine these like these bins where I want to say, what is the bin of things that'll be fine under climate change? And what is the bin of things that if we did A, B, and C, we could help them out? And what is the bin of things that's really going to have a hard time. Um, So we have some examples of things in all of those bins. In the really having a hard time, there's been some evidence. There was a toad in the tropics, for example, that we think already has gone extinct in response to climate change because it's associated with cloud forest. Cloud forest? A cloud forest. A cloud forest is in the tropics. You think of the tropics as a very wet place, but also a very warm place, but there are mountains in the tropics. And on the tops of these mountains, they're especially wet and a little bit cooler. And they have clouds that form around them fairly frequently. And that provides a little climate for the creatures that live on the tops of those mountains. When the climate shifts just a little bit, the clouds can go away. And so that habitat up at the top of the mountain and moving to the next mountain or moving to the another part of the continent that maybe has higher mountains and still has clouds is not something that those creatures can do on their own. And that's the story for this golden toad, that a little bit of climate change eliminated its habitat and it was only associated with those locations and so it went extinct. At least that's what the data suggest. So that's an example of a creature that is not doing well under these changing conditions, and also an example of how we're going to lose some biodiversity. Indeed, it's already happening. And then do you have an example of uh, of an animal that is adapting and, and actually seems to be adapting, that it's changed either his habitat or its location or some of its behavior? Actually, we can look at a group that I've worked with quite a bit for some examples. I study butterflies often, and we do this because everyone loves a good butterfly, but also butterflies are our window into the insects as a whole. So there are some butterflies, for example, that when the climate changes, they move, they change their geography pretty readily, and they have arrived in new locations. That's been well documented for a couple of species of butterfly in the UK, for example. There are other species where they shifted what they ate. That's kind of an evolution. So if you eat a specific thing and you can't, then you can't move to an area where that thing that you eat doesn't live. But there are some cases of butterflies, some species of butterfly changing what they can eat. And then that opens up whole new areas that you could live. So it gives you a chance to track the climate by changing what you eat. But, but that's actually quite extraordinary because the, the butterfly has evolved and has adapted to a certain kind of plant. I mean, it's actually quite chancy for an organism to go and then eat another plant because you don't know whether it's going to make you sick or it might kill you. So there must be some casualties along the way for these species to adapt to another food source because some of those food sources are not going to sit well with them. 
That's right. And not only it's chancy in one other respect too, and that is you have to have the the capacity to make that switch. You know, this is how natural selection works. If you imagine all these butterflies out there flying around in a population, some of those individuals might have a gene that allows them to eat this other plant. Maybe just a few of them do. And if as the climate is changing and it makes new areas climatically suitable, if those individuals who happen to have the right characteristics can find their way over to that habitat, now the selective pressures on them are really favorable and they can do extremely well. And that's one of the ways that you can see very rapid evolution. Now imagine another butterfly in the same situation, but for some reason by chance, doesn't really have that in what we call its gene pool. There's nobody out there that has that characteristic. And that means there will be nobody who can colonize this new plant because you don't have that genetic capacity. Or maybe there are a few individuals out there, but by chance, they're not the ones who happen to discover this new habitat. So it's very chancy in terms of whether or not it's possible for an organism to have that kind of response. And you need to know quite a bit about what genes are out there and what do those genes do in terms of your ability to say, eat a different host plant. In saying that, you've just given a great example of how climate change and our understanding of life at the cellular level, at the genetic level are coming together because it's also helping you understand how it is that some species are able to adapt and why some are not. That's right. Well, I also think that it's a little risky for us to just imagine or assume that each of these butterfly species must have those genes out there and we just allow them to play it out over time. I think assuming that species can evolve their way out just because some do is, is a mistake. And there'll be a lot of species for which that other chance happens. They don't have that trait for whatever reason. They never evolved that capability or there aren't enough of them or the circumstance doesn't work out so that they're in the right place at the right time. And this is a tremendously important and I think fascinating aspect of what we might call conservation biology or applied ecology right now. We have to be able to, again, distinguish who's at risk, who's not. But when we figure out that there are risks, we want to know what could we do to help reduce those risks. And sadly, that word for that is adaptation, which for a biologist is extremely unfortunate because we like to use adaptation to mean evolve. But in the climate change community, we use this word adaptation to mean adjust. And mostly we're talking about ourselves adjusting. So adaptation could be things like humans building bigger seawalls. But humans can also potentially help organisms adapt. We could ask the question, is there this gene in the gene pool of this population that would help it use a different host plant? If we could go out and find that butterfly, we could help increase the frequency of that gene in the population to increase the chances that it might shift to another host plant. But that seems incredibly ambitious. You can't go through every species and figure out which gene is going to allow them to adapt and then intervene on that level so that you try to propagate that particular gene or whatever in the, in the population. The reason why I think it's such a fascinating problem is because it has so many layers of complexity from, on the one hand, you could say we have great opportunity to really reveal it's the century of biology, right? We can learn things about genetics, for example, extraordinarily quickly. I can go out and collect a dozen individuals from a location and I can have their sequence information two days later. So we have amazing genetic sequencing capabilities. Actually, the biggest challenge that we now have, for example, if I want to know something about what genes are out there in my butterfly population is I got to send somebody out there to catch the butterflies. That's actually time consuming and difficult. And we, you know, and if you imagine thinking about the labor and the effort that we could ever put into understanding all of the species and all their genetic composition, all their responses to climate change, it's way too much. So how do we address that? Well, we study some species. I argued the butterflies were a window into the insects. And then we hope and try to draw general understanding from those species that we do study. That's imperfect, but it works on some occasions. 
The other thing we do is that we remind ourselves that we have a real environmental problem. And we actually have to do something about that environmental problem. So at the same time, we might think about how could we help species? How could we help this butterfly? We also have to remember that we have to stop emitting greenhouse gases. So Jessica, are you, are you hopeful? I am hopeful. Wow, that, why is that? That's a surprisingly difficult question, isn't it? I guess I couldn't get out of bed every morning if I wasn't hopeful. Uh, but I'm also nervous. And we must make strides rapidly. If we do not reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the next several decades, if we don't make profound changes in adaptation, people and ecosystems are going to suffer. But we know how to do it. We know where to do it. And we have much science to offer. And that's reason to be hopeful. Jessica Hellman, thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you for the opportunity. And it's been fun chatting about this. Jessica Hellman is a biologist at the University of Notre Dame. Well, one thing that's very clear is that the next century is going to see a different array of species than this one does, and maybe an improved human. That in itself, I find an extraordinarily intriguing idea. Well, we have to define improvement if we are the only species left on the planet. Well, I think if we're the only species left on the planet, it really won't matter. Thanks to the highly evolved talent that helped produce the show, Gary Niederhoff and Barbara Vance. Also thanks to financial support from Rena Shulsky david and Sammy David and the NASA Astrobiology Institute. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers study the origin and nature of life. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to the evolution of evolution. And if you'd like to hear more Big Picture Science, you can find it on our archive on our website, bigpicturescience.org. If you're a podcast listener, but you prefer listening to over-the-air radio, because while that's subject to engineering, it's not genetic engineering, well, check out the listing on our website of radio stations that carry the program. And if your local station is not on that list, consider letting them know that you like the show. Oh, and if you have a comment, a criticism, maybe a suggestion, throw in some faint praise and then email it all to bigpicturescience at SETI.org. Hey, look at me. I'm jumping, but I'm not floating. This anti-gravity thing is a joke. The sooner you can get started, Doctor, the better.